Okay, good morning everyone and welcome. Thanks for joining us for our Inclusive Science Series event today. So my name is Brendan Burns. I'm an academic in the School of Biotechnology and Biomolecular Sciences and I sit across the EDI and sustainability working groups at different levels in the faculty and I really hold these values strongly as does the, the uni as a whole and addressing key UN sustainability development goals is a, is a genuine priority at USW. So I'm really happy to be hosting today's event. Uh, it's focusing on Operation Posidonia, which is a research project designed to foster collaboration and combine indigenous knowledge and science to better understand our environment and to develop meaningful, sustainable and environmental management solutions. I want to begin by acknowledging the Bedigal people who are the traditional custodians of the land from which I'm joining you from today. And I want to pay my respects to the elders past, present and to extend that respect to any Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander peoples here with us today. I want to acknowledge that the role of traditional owners and Indigenous people of Australia as the first knowledge creators and their very deep understanding of the land, the sea and the sky, it forms a very important source of understanding of Australia which should feed into all of our scientific understandings. So today's session will be recorded so if you miss any of it um, you can always come back and jump in or if you need to leave um, it'll be recorded on our website on the link that will go out to everybody who's registered. Also encouraging active audience participation either for those here in the room or out in the ether. So there's a link uh, online or there's a QR code here so you can ask a question anytime on Slido and then we can hopefully get that to that at the end. We'll address as many as we can. So I'm really happy again to be hosting today's event a topic, I guess, um, addressing again the importance of collaborative science, acknowledging gaps in our practices, but also working with local communities to try and create an inclusive research practices. So to kick off the whole session, I just want to introduce our two panelists who are joining us today. So I'll start with Robert, if you want to just give us a quick intro. Yeah, yeah. My name is Robert Cooley. Um, I'm the my name is Robert Cooley. I'm the um, senior ranger for the Gamma Ranger team. So I lead the team. Um, I've got a traditional connection to, um, to Gamma or Botany Bay through my mother. And um, also on my father's side, I've got a, a traditional connection to the New South Wales South Coast around the Aladala Batemans Bay area. Thanks. And Professor Vergas. Hi, so my name is Adriana Verges and I'm a marine ecologist. I'm based at the School of Biological Earth and Environmental Sciences. And a lot of the research that I do is about restoring coastal habitats, which is what Operation Posidonia is about. Thank you. So maybe we could start, and you kind of alluded to it already, Robert, maybe giving us a bit more insight, I guess personal insight, um, into your connection to Gamma and how that kind of led you into joining the Gamma Rangers program. Yeah, well, um, yeah, so in 2018, I was approached by the um, La Perouse Land Council to come across from uh, New South Wales National Parks and Wildlife to um, head up the um, Gamma Ranger team. Um, that was based um, on my working experience and living experience in around Gamma. So I've, I've been in my 33rd year working with um, National Parks and Wildlife um, in around um, the environment, uh, but mostly land based stuff. So um, I've also coming from a fishing family and um, uh, you know, living, living experience in around that bay um, on that ocean. Um, you know, that ocean was very important to my family and um, basically was the, um, the reason that um, you know, um, I was able to, you know, and I'll, I'll put it graphically, have food on the table some nights. If it wasn't from the ocean, you know, um, that, 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 uh, that bay provided food, uh, food for my family most times, and uh, whether that was trading the fish or eating the fish for, for other things. But look, um, I've always had an interest in the ocean and that bay in particular. Um, you know, it was, I was never, um, you know, educated in a um, modern modern sense with science and that, but that ocean and um, that bay was my science lab and living in and around there, learning off my father, who was a cultural fisherman and um, learning, you know, the, the important things about um, what was what, you know, uh, what what was OK to do, what was not OK to do. Um, you know, things like, you know, sizes of fish and types of fish and 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 
and numbers of fish and things like that were very important and that was that message was strongly put for, uh, put to me by my father about looking after the place caring for the place so with that you know um, the land council obviously knew that I come from a fishing background and working in the environment and they thought that was an uh, ideal combination to to set up this team and lead the team from the you know set up those foundations um, for some long-term work with the what we'd hope to do um, with things that our community identified were of real concern to them yeah. around the ocean. So that's where I started. Um, but yeah, I've, I've lived uh, on that northern shore of uh, Botany Bay all my life. Uh, worked there all my life. I was educated there. So, yeah. you know, that, uh, I, had a, I had a strong connection, connection to that area. Well, you mentioned before we came on that you're tomorrow you're going for a big fish out there as well. Yeah, that's correct. So look, I'm, uh, I'm a permit holder. Um, to lead a cultural fishing um, for our community, uh, primarily based around mullet fishing, mullet hauling, mullet netting. So my Gamma Ranger team have um, led that for the um, since 2019. Um, it's a community um, um, event, and um, that particular mullet uh, fishing is is you know entrenched deep in our history and our stories uh, it's carved in stone and timber around that bay and uh, traditionally it was the happiest time of our um happiest time of the year for our communities and also more, uh, for the fishermen and the families the most productive time of the year as well in a commercial sense nowadays it's uh, purely um, um an ex an event or an exercise for a food source for our community there's no commercial activity attached to it and um, you know, basically, that was taken away, taken away from our commercial fishermen in the early 80s, and um, in around 2015, we were able to work with the government, and um, in particular, New South Wales Fisheries, to you know get um, uh, restrictive permits, but enough to allow us to um, you know um, engage in act activity again after 35 years to um, catch that food for our community, um, some of which. Are resigned to buying uh, mullet from fish markets and other places, yeah. but now they can walk out of their doors, out of their front doors, and be amongst it, participate in the activity, and taking home a feed of fish, um, you know, on the spot there. So, again, it's a it's a really important activity for our community, and one that um, nowadays is very inclusive of all. It's not just a men's fishing cultural activity. Um, families are strongly encouraged to come and participate in that and learn all about that so it's great yeah it's been a great thing for us excellent all right might jump to adriana so you're a um a bit of a trail blazer in the algal forest uh, world um maybe you could give us a quick bit of background on operation posidonia and its goals i guess sure so operation posidonia is about restoring a species of seagrass called posidonia australis um, it's the largest seagrass that we have in australia it actually you find it along the entire southern half of the continent all the way from wallace lake down to tasmania and halfway up western australia so it's a very important species nationwide and it supports a unique kind of ecological community of, of fish of crabs of invertebrates it supports you know species like the mullet and um, because of the high productivity of of the seagrass. Um, unfortunately, around the Sydney region, Posidonia has been declining very fast, so fast that um, it's now listed as endangered by the Commonwealth government, by the state government, and it is because of urbanization. So Posidonia likes to live where us humans like to settle down, basically, which is near, you know, the cities, near the bays, near protected, sheltered embayments. So coastal development, pollution, boating activities like, say, swing moorings with chains, they're the kind of human activities that are damaging Posidonia. So a few years ago, we started a restoration pro program to try and um, stop the decline and bring back the meadows that used to be here. So we started in Port Stephens, uh, where we've done all our kind of proof of concept and we have an exciting kind of way of restoring the seagrass. Because there's not that much of it left, we can't just take it from one place and put it in another place. We actually have, um, what we do now is we rescue seagrass fragments that become naturally detached after big storms um, and they're collected by the community 
by local people, dog walkers, people that go for a walk along the beach. They collect those fragments. We have collection stations and then we take them from there um, underwater to be restored. So we've done all this work in Port Stevens, but from you know, from the time that the Gamay Rangers were were established, we started talking, um, Robert and I and, and the, the Ranger team and other colleagues from here, from UNSW, and we started kind of talking about the possibility of taking the project to Gamay, to Botany Bay, because that's a very important bay for Posidonia as well. But we've lost about 50% of, of what used to be there. Yeah. So that's kind of how this kind of relationship started. Um, we were doing it in Port Stevens. The Gamay Rangers um, program started here and it was a very natural kind of progression to, to bring it over. And we're still in the process of bringing it over. Yeah, excellent. Um, so I guess one we were unfortunately we're going to have a, a student Bryce that couldn't make it here today, but maybe I'll, we're going to Robert. You could briefly touch on, um, I guess, as a UNSW student and a Gamma Ranger, um, I guess the importance of these kind of collaboration benefits for, for students. Yeah, thanks. Well, um, for us that was that was the key connection. Um, you know, to be brutally honest, we didn't have the knowledge uh, a knowledge of why um, things were, why those seagrass beds were disappearing. We could see them, um, but we didn't have the knowledge of why. Um, you know, we'd done a bit of research and, um, and uh, uh, you know, we, we, we read a little bit about Pos uh, Operation Posidonia and stuff like that and thought, well, you know, this is one of the key reasons why we need a ranger team. So we could um, learn a little bit more about it um, by working with these guys, but not only that, you know, um, engaging some of our younger community, uh, you know, planting the seed of, hey, you know, there's a really good opportunity to, you know, educate our young people uh, in a lot more detail, a lot more depth um, to give us a better understanding of what was going on and some first-hand knowledge that we could pass back down to our, our community and our elders who have raised concerns for many, many years. And they'd describe it as this big dark, uh, patch that come around the base. Now it's, I can see a dark patch here and there. Mm. And, um, you know, now um, this this relationship has um, given us that knowledge and understanding. Well, that's seagrass. Um, and yes, um, it is disappearing. And so Bryce, you know, studying, and I've got another young ranger studying uh, marine science as well, Yaron Doyle. So, you know, um, hopefully that, um, you know the op, you know that that um, you know that partnership with UNSW and um, our ranger team is enabling that transfer of information that uh, you know it, it might be as simple as it used to look like this or it used to look like that that used to be there and not this. and then these guys are coming back well you know um, this is why it's happening you know whether it's pollution or boat you know uh, ferry wash or boat wash ship wash or anchoring and things like that you know, we could see these things happening. You know, we could see the anchor marks through the um, seagrass, but we didn't, you know, we didn't think much of it. It was yeah. just, you know, just a mark in the sand. But, you know, now this this working relationship it has enabled us to get that, you know, that knowledge that, hey, this is a real concern. And, you know, that, you know, we need to get it out there and uh, hopefully, um, you know, you know, have a voice which we've never had in the management of the bay to hopefully influence you know how you know that is um worked in the future you know you know whether it's lobbying maritime and, and these guys or, or putting you know leaning on the, you know, leaning on them heavily to you know start thinking a little bit different because what's happening is um it's affecting our community you know our community and our elders when we take them out we say, well, They'll tell us that you couldn't walk two or three meters off that shore, even closer sometimes, without getting nipped by blue swimming crabs. Yeah. Now I could go for a dive out there for two or three hours, and I might get three or four. You know, and um, so you know that kind of information we can pass up. And then you know, but yeah, yeah, you know, with Bryce and that getting that edge, that formal education, you know, it's really giving us uh, not only a career path or an opportunity for our kids, but to maybe even lead that um, yeah. that science, you know, those that that work around the bay themselves. Well, you know, might 
I can see a day not far in the future where we've got Indigenous science with a connection to Gamme um, teaching our young kids, like Adrian and are doing to our young kids now. Hopefully that um, Bryce, um, you know, and with his studies and Yara will be you know, kind of Adriana in 10 years down the track teaching That's our kids. We would love at, you know, at a university level, that it would be Indigenous people that are teaching this because there's a limit to what even myself or Adriana, we might have the passion, but we don't have the Indigenous background or knowledge and, and not necessarily the best voices. We are a voice. But that is the hope. I think that's what UNSW is really driving at. And that, I think it's not just acquiring knowledge, but then what you're talking about, transferring knowledge, either within a community or between Indigenous and non-Indigenous, I think it's really, really important. Yeah, and I think that's the great thing about this partnership. Again, you know, we could see what was happening, but we didn't know why. Now we know why. You know, um, we can focus our training and our education um, you know, targeting the, um, specific training that will enable us to do something about it. And we don't want to be standing on the sidelines shouting, do this, do that. Yeah. What we're saying is we want to educate ourselves, we want to upskill, and we want to get our feet wet and our hands dirty doing the actual work. And, and you know, we are, you know, we're on the verge of some really exciting stuff. And, you know, um, we've been talking about it now for three years. And um, we're finally getting um, to where we want to be. And um, so, yeah, I think it's you know a really ideal relationship. And you know, I, I've said it before, and it's a yeah, it's for me, it's a, a perfect partnership, yeah. really. No, that's great. So, I guess on the topic of, of sustainability, um, I guess it's for, for both of you to go to this. Like, what I guess. What does sustainability mean to you personally, individually, and, and, and I guess, or even what drove your interest in sustainability in the first place? Yeah, again, um, I, you know, coming from a fish and family, it was important that um, you know we thought about what we're doing today and the impacts it will have, you know, in, in many years' time for our community. You know, um, you know, for us, it's you know, it's important that um, you know, there's things that we done 20 years ago that the kids probably can't do now, you know, um, but, you know, but we have an opportunity to you know, change that a little bit. So, you know, for us, you know, um, sustainability is, that's, you know, for us, our culture is all about sustainability, you know, and, you know, the, my father from a very young age, taught me, you know, only take as much as you need or, you know, don't take this or sizes, you know, and things like that. And they're a little bit different from, you know, uh, traditional, well, not traditional, but modern ways of uh, what major agencies like fisheries and that, how they think about it. We think about it a little bit different. You know, we, we don't pull out a caliper to measure something down to the millimetre or things like that. We can, you know, we might look at it, and measure it by hand, and that's how we've done it. You know, okay, that's big enough that fits in your hand, or you know, that's big enough or or small enough. It wasn't always about so you know, like it was just about hey, looking at something and say that's okay. And um, you know, but things have changed now, even from you know, 20, 30 years ago. You know, and they're they're changing all the time, and you know, we find that hard to to understand sometimes because we can we know we hey, if we just look at something. It's yeah. fine, and some of our ideas are a little bit different on on size limits and that. You know, in in fact, some of them are totally opposite. When we think about lobsters and stuff like that, um, you know, um, and sizes and and what's okay. Yeah. Um, you know, and and how many we can take or and things like that. So, look, sustainability is everything to us. You know, and you know, it, it, it will have, it does, you know, the health of that ocean, it does have real impacts on the health of our community. And I'll say it a lot. So it's important that, you know, we we look after it because it looks after us and, and that's how we see it. And if we don't look after us, then, you know, it's it's a pretty scary future. Yeah, no, no, thanks, Adriana. Maybe it's your, your thoughts on sustainability, I guess, um, from a personal point of view. Well, I guess, I don't know, we share that, right? Like for, you know, ev everything I do in the context of restoration is also about yeah. sustainability, right? So, and, and, you know, things have declined 
you know, dramatically in the last few decades, but we're at a very exciting point in time where we actually have the knowledge and the scientific kind of expertise to turn things around and actually go back, you know, so go from a trajectory of decline to a trajectory of recovery. That's that's what we're in the business of doing. And it is complex to do that in a sustainable way because obviously on, on top of all the pollution and other human impacts that we have, there's also climate change. So to do restoration in a truly sustainable way, you have to kind of future proof those um, those restoration projects so that you're already kind of thinking about the the warmer conditions that are ahead. So if we all do the right thing and we meet the Paris Agreement and we reduce our carbon emissions, we're still facing a certain amount of warming that is inevitable. So we need to prepare for that. So doing restoration in a sustainable way means means that means not just restoring for today, but restoring for the future. So but yeah, so sustainability really is at the very kind of you know, center point of of all our efforts, pretty much. Yeah, it's not just in the research, but in everyday living. Absolutely. Um, this is going on um, on the theme of of the concept of of cultural res restoration. So, what this actually has played into the research project. Um, if you want, I can just quickly start. So for, from from our perspective, so as ecologists, we look at an ecological community and we identify species that are particularly important, maybe because they're habitat forming, they're foundation species that support other species or, you know, keystone species that play a particularly important role ecologically. Um, and we have a reasonable handle on those. But what I think is really exciting and important about our collaboration with Robert and the Gamay Rangers is getting an understanding of the culturally important species because, you know, they, they're just as important as the ecologically kind of important species. So getting an understanding of, you know, what are the cultural connections? What are the, the, the species that, that mean um, certain things? And, and I guess that's the, the stage that I'm really excited about embarking next, which is, you know, trying to combine both and not just like what Robert was explaining about the mullet fishing. He's essentially restoring a cultural practice. So it's, it is another type of restoration. It's cultural restoration. And I think merging ecological and cultural restoration um, you know creates this kind of synergy where the sum is greater than than the parts so that's that's what really excites me about it yeah yeah look I, I'd agree I mean you know like I the areas we focus on are all areas that uh, habitat for fish species that are cultures culturally significant to us locally so you know that's the great thing and you know again we've we felt that um, our concerns for a long time weren't taken into, consider into consideration when, you know, for example, managing an aquatic reserve, mm. you know, um, we were never consulted. It was just this, how we're going to do it. And we could see that, you know, the, the aquatic reserve on our doorstep, the decline that's declining. And, you know, it's uh, the first sort of reason or, and the only reason we're always given, well, Overfishing is the only reason, which is not true. It's how they manage it is 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 having impacts on why those um, areas are declining as well. But you know, we felt that overfishing was always an easy excuse, uh, or maybe not excuse, but you know, an easy and an, an easy reply. Um, but you know, they failed to mention you know the the management styles they're putting in place in around you know sea urchins and other things you can take and you can't take and and stuff like that. And it, it was never it was never a a, a, a consideration or, or it was never open to that. Okay, well, how about how you're managing it? You know, and this is one of the reasons that um, our, our ranger team was formed because you know we want to have influence on how the bay is managing the future and you know learning a little bit more of the scientists is you know now giving us that um, you know empowering us to have that strength and have that voice to to speak confidently about our concerns now and and you know and even myself it was never going to be a scientist yeah. i can you know i can now you know um you know reference some scientific terms and, and, and reasons why and you know, which I never thought I could but working with these guys 
it, it'll enable and it's enabled me to, to be able to do that and speak confidently. Well, this is why it's happening. Oh, you know, this is one of the reasons. It's not always overfishing. It's mismanagement. If I could be yeah. um, blunt, yeah, it's mismanagement. Some of the years that uh, um, are part of the reasons why these places are declining. And again, it's having direct impacts on our community. Um, so now we've got a resource and you know, we're arming ourselves every day. We're educating ourselves and we want to be like I so said, we, we want to be in there at the, you know, at the coal face doing some of the work and you know, um, but we had to learn about it first because you know, again, we just didn't have the knowledge, yeah. but we're gaining okay. that and, um, and more and more um, as our relationship builds um, and, and strengthens, the more we're learning that, you know, I think, um, you know, the you know, it benefit everybody and, and I think all the work we do doesn't just benefit the Indigenous community, it benefits everybody. You know, we're going to bat for everybody, not not just our Indigenous community, we're there, for, you know, we're lobbying for everybody and fighting for everybody to, you know, get people to think a little bit different. No, it's really important. Do you, do you think you've been able to or starting to get that kind of influence, that voice in terms of lobbying local government or water bodies in terms of these kinds of changes, I guess. I think we have, you know, like, um, you know, little wind, little wins for us, um, you know, councils, for example, in around the bay, getting to think a little bit different of, you know, you, how about you do away the old Boomstead Nile mesh net um, gross pollutant traps and replace them with a, a lot more sturdier one that will not burst during a downpour and things like that. So we've noticed councils, you know, we, we we part of our patrol plan is uh, we've got some waypoints and a lot of them are those gross pollutant traps. Some you know, may not be um, maintained as they should be. Um, some we, we've lobbied to get them, um, you know, replace the old net style ones with the um, solid, uh, you know, like metal and, and concrete um, gross pollutant traps and maintain them um, appropriately so they don't spew litter out into the bay, you know. Um, you know, a relationship with um, Sydney Ports, which always, or, or put the Port Authority, which always hasn't always been great, but we've got a really solid relationship with those guys now. Mm -hmm. A little bit of respect both ways, learning a little bit more about where they're coming from. They're learning a little bit more about where we're coming from. Um, the Ampol fuel storage um, facility across the bay. Um, we had some awkward moments with those guys in the initial stage of our Ranger program, but We've got some open dialogue now and um, we just need to know what's going on because if, if you know, for example, if they're allowed to flush thousands of litres of uh, raw fuel into the bay under extreme weather conditions, we may not be able to stop it, but hey, you know, let us know so our community don't go fishing or swimming in that bay or, and stuff like that rather than, you know, just seeing a, a, a heap of boats and uh, nets out there trying to break uh, fuels spills up and yeah. contain them. Let us know. Just let us know. We might not be able to stop it, but just a little thing. Show us a bit of respect and let us know that something's happening. There's a event on. If you need assistance, we're here to help. Yeah, communicating. I think you kind of both alluded to it, um, but there's again more of a personal experience. What's the best part of, of this collaboration? I guess Game of Rangers with Adrian and yourself, or with UNSW and, and the Game of Rangers, and maybe both of you. What's the what's the highlight, I guess, of the collaboration? Oh, look, it's you know, it, it's a critically important job, but it's a fun job being out in the bay and doing it. But you know, I I think for us as an Indigenous community, is learning, and you know, arming ourselves with you know that that um, education on why things are happening, so we can confidently go on again lobby the various organizations agencies and and whatever that or stakeholders around the bay to, to um maybe have a little bit of think about how they rethink how they're doing things so for us it's arming ourselves at education and obviously you know with bryce um studying and you know this relationship in in some in some instances allowed him to uh, work as a gamma ranger and uh while we're working with the scientists even tick you know, credits off his degree in that. I mean, how good's that? Yeah. Who would have ever thought sure. that? You know, and and that's the first for the range national ranger program all around the country, and other now other ranger programs around the country are looking at us. And how do you do that? You know, I've got inquiries from the south coast, north coast. Hey, we want, how do, we want to do what you guys are doing. Yeah. 
you know, we've got concerns about our habitat down in Jervis Bay, you know, far south coast, north coast, up to Tweed Heads. Hey, can you come and talk about what you're doing with the scientists? Because we've got the same concerns. So, you know, I think we're leading, you know, like people at other range of groups are uh, seeing what we're doing. Yeah. Other communities are seeing what we're doing. And, you know, the word's getting out there that, hey, look, you know, we let's, let's put, you know, let's arm ourselves with education, with the education and, you know, um, let's lobby to get our own range of groups yeah. and do our little bit for our patch. Well, and it then, can become like a little model system if you like that you establish it. Yeah. I work with um, some people out in, in Shark Bay in Western Australia um, and with, with, uh, with the rangers, the Malgana rangers out there. And it's the same thing where we're trying to get a genuine two-way exchange where we're learning off country and then trying to also contribute back with the knowledge that we're getting there. So it's really Oh, absolutely. And, you know, and even um, rangers from Arnhem Land and stuff, you know, we we had a plan to, to meet up with those guys, a, a little bit of, you know, um, uh, get together and talk about what teachers, but COVID ruined that. But, you know, um, people are, are seeing what we're doing and um, want to do a bit of the same. Yeah. In particular, the guys on the, the South Coast. Um, I, I actually was going to say the same <laughs> for me, like in terms of a highlight, it is learning. Um, it is learning about, um, you know, the Game Rangers, the Game kind of history, you know, pre uh, colonization, you know, what's important um, to you guys. So, but also, as you say, it is actually fun, like the, the, the kind of work we are very fortunate, like we're literally, you know, snorkeling and looking at fascinating creatures and, you know, we're, we're, yeah, we're we're fortunate that the hands-on component is actually being in nature and and spending time together in pretty special places. So yeah, that's a bit of a highlight as well. Yeah, sure. Excellent. We might actually start to jump in because we've got some questions coming through on Slido. So for the audience out in the ether, or maybe some people here. Yes, if you if you have any questions in the audience out here you want to throw, please feel free. <laughs> I was a bit curious, so you mentioned how um, climate change could be um, a problem with warming temperatures, even if we stick to the Paris um, Agreement goals. Um, and you said you're accounting for that. Like, how do you account for that? Do you have to like uh, focus your efforts in regions where you know? change in the future? Yeah, so I don't know if I need to repeat the question. Yeah, OK, so this was about, you know, how how do we future proof restoration? So how do we account for this warming that we know is going to happen? How can we do restoration today that prepares ecological communities for those warmer conditions? And um, it's something we're working on. So that's the more kind of research component of what we're doing. And the way we're looking into this is looking at the um, the warm adaptation of the ecological communities that exist today. So and the and the kind of, for example, the kind of questions we're asking is, are there some genotypes? Are there some Posidonia populations that are already adapted to warmer conditions and that we can bring into the Sydney region? So maybe, for example, in Wallace Lake, the temperature is a few degrees warmer. If we can scientifically show that those populations are genetically adapted to those warmer conditions? Can we mix them in with the local genotypes so that we're increasing the chances that the populations of the future will be will, will be able to you know, keep reproducing and, and subsist? Um, yeah, that's more like the cutting edge kind of scientific research that we're working on. And it's not just us, you know, people that do coral restoration or, you know, even on land, trees, they, they, they're already kind of working in that direction. So I'm just wondering, because this seems to be very important you know, for us for its scientific uh, indigenous culture collaboration. And you said before that, you know, other communities are starting to see take that on board as well. What do you think um, you need, what sort of support do you think you need for that should actually become standard practice around Australia so that there is um, a lot more of these types of collaboration around the country? Oh, look, I, I think um, we need the opportunity to get out there to do the work to show that it works, what we're doing. Yeah, we, um, 
Yeah, like, I, th I think, you know, um, what we're doing is doing exactly that, showing that, you know, this, you know, there's there's a lot you need to, to put together for these things to happen and, and we've been working on it for three years, so it's not simple. But hopefully the stuff that we're doing and, and um, once we get off the ground and running, you know, um, uh, at 100 miles an hour that um, we're going to break down the doors and, but look, there's a lot of things that, that need to happen. I think I think the right people need to listen. Um, I think, you know, the, the major agencies who manage our waterways need to start listening. Um, and I think this co collaboration um, is going to um, push a strong voice to um, to make them think and change. Because we, you know, whether we like it or not, we need their support. We need them to listen. If they don't, you know, we're just beating, beating our heads against a brick wall. So look, I think, um, I think, you know, the more we're getting out there to our indigenous communities, I think that's a powerful voice. Unity has always been our strength. Um, so I think the more we can get out, you know, and, and I know Adriana's uh, linked up with the South Coast communities and stuff like that. Um, um, at, you know, on the far south coast of the room and you know I've linked up with the guys at Jervis Bay they're going to come up and and hopefully sit down with Adriana and talk a little bit I think I've hooked Adriana up with a, uh, another ranger who leads a um, team down at Jervis Bay who are funded by the you know, same body as we are but look I think um, yeah I, I don't know if I answered your question probably but I just think we need those in, in those that are in power to start listening to us yeah i think the only thing i would add is money money really helps right like okay, money so money <laughs> money to create the kind of you know the, the gamay ranger program mm -hmm. is a big investment and i guess by showing that it works hopefully that will create an incentive to create you know similar things in in other um aboriginal land councils for example but i mean it's, it's pretty exciting because it's the first urban Indigenous Ranger program in, in the country mm. and it, it comes with its own kind of challenges, right? In some ways, all urban people are less connected to nature, right? Because we live in this urbanized environment, but uh, but there's more of us. So the potential to do things is, is perhaps greater than in other regions. So everything has its challenges, but also it, its rewards. That's great. We might, we'll, we'll hit a couple of questions that are coming through on Slido now, and we've kind of alluded to it with, with Bryce's um, work, but it's a question here is, are there also opportunities for non-Indigenous students to work with Indi Indigenous community members on projects like this? Um, I mean, from my perspective, if, 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 if Robert and his team welcome it, you know, I would, I would love to facilitate it. <clears throat> Just to explain, so Bryce is doing science a science degree at UNSW and he did a research internship so that's like a it's a unit where you get six units of credit um, but it's not like normal assessments you know you get assessed on the actual research you do so it was a pretty cool thing where he was able to do some scientific research to support this project while also kind of aligning with his normal work as a ranger so he's like a part-time ranger part-time student um, that kind of those kind of opportunities, those research projects are a really exciting way to kind of get into research and know whether that's kind of where you want to go or even just to have that experience in your degree. So I could definitely foresee opportunities for creating research units that involve a collaboration and yeah. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, you know, um, the Commonwealth Government has announced a, a massive funding boost to a range of program. So um, what we're what we're putting forward now is an idea to rather than trainee rangers, um, which we've had before, we, we're going to um, open it up to student rangers. So um, so uh, uh, rangers working in, within on with the gamma rangers and um, studying um, marine sciences at the University of New South Wales, and we've actually um, also stated that um, we're going to open that up to non-indigenous candidates as well so it won't be an exclusive um, indigenous ranger team we want to expand that and open it up so we can you know continue that um, that learning off each other yeah. and um, we think it you know can only help can only benefit everybody if um, 
you know, that's the way we go. So we don't want to restrict it now to just Indigenous rangers working on a team. We're definitely opening up to um, non-Indigenous rangers to, yeah. you know, those with interest to, to come on board. And, um, and um, we've, we've, you know, yeah, that's that's something we have identified that we now want to um, because we do get a fair few inquiries. Yeah. How do we, you know, um, can you let white fella or yeah, you know, on, on your team? You, yeah. you know, we want to we want to do what you're doing because it's important to us. Yeah. So you know, I, I think it's a great great initiative. It's a balance, I guess. Absolutely, yeah. and you know, uh, I think it's a great thing that um, you know we now have got the opportunity with this expansion and. We are specifically focusing on um, indi oh, not Indigenous, but female rangers, um, given that there's five permanent male rangers and two, you know, um, three um, casual rangers and two admin staff. But um, um, we've, we've identified that that's, there's a little bit of hole there, a little yeah. bit of lack of balance. So we want to um, try and target um, female, Rangers and um, it, it won't be just restricted to Indigenous Rangers. Yeah, no, that's great. That's, <coughs> it's a lot of the work at UNSW is also trying to address a lot of EDI challenges, gender balance and different aspects of well, life here. So I think it's really important. Um, this one, I guess, could either, either of you, it's also about how, how to go about collaboration in the first place. Um, so advice for researchers who want to implement collaboration with with local communities. I know it was last year, I think the CSIRO or a collaboration, they have these guidelines, our knowledge, our way, I think. But I think it's ways of going forward. If you're a researcher, how do I, how do I approach a local community to work together? And I don't know the best way to do that, but I'd, maybe you can just give insight into the best, to your thoughts on it, perhaps. Oh, look, yeah, it's a good question. It come, does come up often, you know. Um, it can be a little bit intimidating or awkward yeah. for a non-Indigenous person to, to come to the community and say, we're going to do this. And I understand that. I do understand that. But what we're trying to get out there is um, just reach out to us. You know, we're, you know, um, we're changing as well. And, and people ask in question, we see that as a sign of respect. Yeah. So, you know, and um, um, particularly through our, our range program, our land council, you know, we're, we're one thing I'm, I'm really proud of our community is we're really good at um, sharing our culture yeah. and our stories and even our sites um, uh, um, you know, um, and I, I understand it can be a little bit daunting for, for a researcher but uh, uh, Adriana and, and her team reached out to us yeah. and look where we are now yeah. just to you know touch base you know our, from our very first meeting up here you know they, we come up here we, you know we could feel the warmth straight away so we knew it was genuine. Yeah. We're on, you know, we want the same things, and just reach out to us. Um, apart from me, we're not that scary, yeah, you, know, you know. But yeah, you know, our, our, you know, we're always warm and open to people who show an interest in our, yeah. in our culture and our welfare. So, but I know it can be difficult. I know it's a little bit daunting. And not just putting there and i don't mean you adriana but a, a, a scientist scientific not putting their scientific interest first making sure that it's a genuine collaboration and, and not just saying oh, this is what i want to do in your area it's not not putting those values more of a, a genuine collaboration i guess is really important oh absolutely and i think i told from our very first meeting i was very open yeah. with uh, adriana and, and alistair and ian and the team and i was, i said to him and i'm probably incriminate myself a little bit <laughs> but I, I used to see their little um grids up on the um um intertidal zones up at, around cape banks aquatic reserve and i thought they didn't belong there so i'd smash them with a rock <laughs> you know and I, no and, and they'd come on and look there was a little bit of an awkward relation back in those days the early 80s you know um the scientists saw that their um little experiments were getting damaged and um and you know there was a little bit there was you know but look working with adriana and and, and ian and, and alistair have given us a really solid understanding of what those things are about and they're helping you know um get some valuable information around those areas to help us but i was pretty the bridge yeah and i was pretty open i i and I, I probably shouldn't say it you know on, on on camera but i used to 
you know, from our state, you know, these little silver um, gauze um, squares on the rocks didn't look right. Um, so, I, you know, I'd, I'd find the biggest rock I could and crack them off. <laughs> but now if anybody touches them, it's like, yeah, hey, yeah, exactly. you know, yeah, yeah. get away. Um, yeah, um, I think something that really helps with every relationship is just spending time together, yeah. right? Um, so being in a rush doesn't help. Um, building a relationship takes time and, you know, the ranger group started and they've been kind of getting more and more money to do more things. We're still in the process of fundraising. So, um, you know, it, it yeah, it has taken three years and here we are now. So, but um, spending time listening to what each other, you know, things and wants and, you know, that that really, really helps. Yeah. So not 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 very conducive to, I find sometimes now a lot of um, grants request, um, you know, an indigenous participation component or things like that. And unless that it genuinely already exists, it's not something you can create, yeah, you know, in a few a weeks. Yeah. yeah. And or yeah, it's just it's just impossible, basically. Yeah. You know, it's either like fake or it takes time. Yeah. So yeah, I think um, but I'm, I'm really grateful to how open um, Robert and his team have always been yeah. with us. They've been there's been a very genuine kind of mutual curiosity and, and respect that I think has has really helped. Yeah. Cool. This one's a bit more general. Um, sorry, sorry, no, go for it. Sorry, I was. So, so an honors project is just like a one year project. So I would say it would be too short to create a, a relationship from the start. However, if an honors project was to come and, and, and work with the Rangers, they, they would be building, you know, they would be working, you know, um, based on the relationship that is already existing, right? So it's definitely possible. Within a PhD, I think there would be scope to potentially start a completely new relationship. Uh, you know, PhD is three and a half years, so there, there could be. But, um, you know, yeah, may, maybe a bit risky, but. So this one, I, I guess we'll, we'll be wrapping up soon, and this is more of a broad one, which almost anybody could answer, but it's the. What are the most important things that young people can do to live more sustainably? Could have nothing to do with this operation, but just life in general. What what young people can do to make, and it's it. I mean, it's always the challenge because we think about to make real changes. It's probably government and big business, but it's individuals you can make changes as well. So I guess what are the, what are the things as an individual to to live in a more sustainable, to make your little world more sustainable? I guess. I mean, I think I don't know. I would say that. Um, Living in a more connected way to nature, nearly by definition, will get you living more sustainably. Um, get, you know, learning, learning about how things work and, and what impact your activities have. I think there's definitely huge scope for all of us to to live more sustainable lives, you know, by, you know, more sustainable and healthier lives, you know, cycling, walking instead of, you know, taking the car or whatever, you know, from small things like that. Um, to then the kind of structural changes that do need to happen for for real change to yeah. to occur, right? So there's there's a, a continuum, and it, it all it all matters. And then w when you become educated and you learn sharing those stories, talking to people, spreading the word, I think that really 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 helps as well. Yeah, it's probably a science question, not that probably. All, but look, I think you nailed it. You know, I think um, just getting out there living you know connecting with nature a little bit more um rather than you know your tele your mobile phones and things like that but you know just getting out in nature looking um learning about things and you know and be open to um doing things a little bit different yeah that's great i'm not sure if we should wrap up soon i guess so i think this is unless any more questions from the floor do you, want, do you have a question here yeah, please on the back of the 
I mean, yeah, th Sorry. definitely. The, so the questions about volunteering opportunities and yes, like we 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 definitely because our project with, with regards to restoration depends on volunteers collecting the shoots and then that's the shoots that we use for restoration. We do a lot of um, yeah, we have a lot of volunteers and kind of citizen scientists that are part of the project. So yeah, it's a big part of of everything we do actually. Yeah. <coughs> Excellent. So. Thank you everyone again. We've reached the end of today's event. I want to thank everyone for joining us either here in person or in the in the ether, wherever you are. Um, big thank you to the panelists, um, to Robert and Adriana for all of your insights, both personally, but also broadly how it's all taken place. Big thanks to Kira and Michaela who are in the background and Ethan who's behind the camera. None of this would happen if any of this, if these guys weren't, weren't pushing all the, all the strings. But it's really good to see all the intersecting ideas um, and values, obviously, between First Nation Gamay Rangers and scientists here at UNSW like Adriana. This is not only showcases specific venture, but it's also part of a, a goal in the faculty and the UNSW as a, as a whole to try and improve cultural awareness. And this kind of activity hopefully does that as one part of it. But ensuring Indigenous knowledge is part of our science curricula is a, is a long term goal that we've got here. We're hoping that UNSW can actually be a real leader um, in bridging these gaps between um, the knowledge that we're getting from Indigenous knowledge that we can improve our scientific teachings. Um, and we know that sharing and recognising Indigenous knowledge can actually ensure that our students are better equipped um, to be part of a catalyst of change in increasing opportunities for First Nations people, which I think is really important. So and as a bit of a call to action, um, if anyone wants to be part of a positive change, and you mentioned that as volunteering, so there is possibly to do that with this Operation Posidonia, um, either as a volunteer or even making a donation. So you can jump on the website, which I think could be coming up somewhere as, as a link, but we'll come, we'll follow up with, with some um, comms post this event. Um, as I said at the start, this session has also been recorded, so you can always jump on um, to check this out. I think there's gonna be a survey also coming up just to some feedback on this event, which would be great if you can, if you can fill that out. Um, and also if you wanna watch any, um, previous inclusive science series that will also be up on the, the science website as well. So that's it. Thanks again, everyone, for, for joining and for this opportunity and have a great day.